here with HIT 292 Healthcare Reimbursement. We are now on week 10. Oh my goodness, we are facing down November. We are on Chapter 5, Manage Care Plans. And um, we are still on ob course objectives 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, which you can find in your syllabus. And those correlate to our unit objectives 9.4.1 through 9.4.11 and 9.5.1 through 9.5.5 and 9.6.1 through 9.6.3. So again, go back to your syllabus and take a look at those because that has their goals for this week when you're talking about managed care plans. All right, so what are we going to be learning according to our book? We're going to be defining that term, managed care. What does it mean? The origins of managed care. How did it begin? Characteristics of managed care in terms of quality and cost effectiveness, because that has really become where they're going with this. Talking about the common, common care management tools that are used in managed care, the accreditation processes, performance improvement initiatives that are used in managed care. What kind of cost controls do they use? Contract management, what are carve-outs? The types of managed care plans along a continuum. And notice the word control there. Managed care wants to control. Um, then how are managed care plans used in states Medicaid programs, CHIP programs, and Medicare? Because we think about Medicare Advantage. We talked about that last week with government-sponsored health care programs when we talked about CHIP too and Medicaid. And then talk about types of integrated delivery systems. So let's talk about managed care plans. Their goal is to provide affordable, high quality health care at the least amount of cost. Again, they're trying to control cost and by managing access, and they hope to do it without sacrificing the quality of health care. Um, so that's their, their ultimate goal of managed care. It's to control cost by managing access without sacrificing the quality of health care. All right, so they look at administrative, clinical, and financial aspects. Origins of managed care. Back in 1906, the Western Clinic was the first example of managed care. Then in 1929, Blue Cross appeared on the horizon and began offering plans. In the 1930s, you have Kaiser Construction Company health care plan for its workers. And then in 1973, the HMO Act came into being. So this is really the origin of managed care. And I think all this is laid out in your book, and you can take a look at it there in Chapter 5 and read about it in a little bit more detail. I'm not going to dwell on it. Let's move on to characteristics of managed care organizations. They do want to provide high quality care. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's that is what they want to have happen. However, how they go about it um, can sometimes be challenging to that high quality of care. So they look at selection of providers. They talk about population. They work on care management, and then they have an aspect of ensuring quality through accreditation and performance improvement. Now, all these things are really good. They are very good, and we want to see them for all people. It would be nice if all had, had this type of ideal medical care, health care, and coverage. They look at service management by medical by using medical necessity and utilization management. They act as a gatekeeper. They require prior approvals, and they do gather multiple opinions. They have case managers, and they do manage prescriptions. They have formularies, and they definitely are looking at what prescriptions people are on and what their options are. So they have service management to making their care cost effective. Then in terms of reimbursement, they have prospective payment systems. They use capitation. Um, and if you have not studied capitation or you don't remember what it means, take a look. Look it up, okay? Because you will need to know that. Bundled payments are new um, new one that they are pushing. Global payments, episode payments. Then financial incentives, 
they require providers to meet fiscal targets in order to get a financial incentive. Um, and then members are incentivized by using in-network providers for lower cost. And most of these in-network providers have been negotiated with and under contracts to provide healthcare services at a lower cost. So that's where the um, financials are, not just, not just the fiscal targets too. All right, case man care management tools, or case management tools, so to speak. You have your primary care physician who is your gatekeeper, and you have to go through him or her to get referrals to specialists. They want to keep you at that primary care setting because it's the least expensive and the easiest to manage at. They want to talk about, they want to manage disease. They want to prevent exacerbations of chronic diseases such as CHF, CAD, asthma, COPD. Um, anything that's going to come back and cause the patient to have to have more visits or more services, they want to be they want to be actively preventing that through improved care. They do want to improve health and quality of life, reduce hospital admissions, decrease hospital and total health care costs. All of these are really good things. Don't get me wrong; these are really good things, and um, hopefully, everyone in healthcare wants to do these things because who really wants to go to a hospital? Who really wants to be sick? Nobody. Um, so, the more that we can improve health and quality of life, reduce those hospital admissions, um, and decrease healthcare costs, it's all good. It's just that sometimes the way things happen, or or companies or organizations go about it might not always be the best and that's where the challenge comes in how do you make it happen in a good way all right evidence-based clinical guidelines they have really gone into this to look at evidence-based medicine and look for those to be applied um, by healthcare organizations so that clinical decision making is guided by best practices and what has been clinically proven um, through studies to be the best way to care for patients they want to standardize optimal care for all patients and deliver comprehensive coordinated care across multiple providers so that things are tests are not getting um, repeated and um, things are not being missed. Um, for instance, it, let's say you have a patient who is on a diuretic. Um, maybe they have congestive heart failure and they are discharged without that diuretic and find themselves back in the hospital a couple of days later after discharge with a CHF exacerbation because the diuretic wasn't prescribed and didn't get taken by the patient and that caused that fluid buildup. So they want to try and put things into place to prevent that from happening, which again, that's good that we should all be doing that. Service management tools, again, medical necessity versus utilization management. They use both, but they are slightly different. I'm going to let you read through these and talk through them um, to yourself. If you have questions, let me know. Utilization review includes a clinical review, usually by an RN um, or an LPN, and they look at the established criteria. And the uh, criteria that they use is often based on intensity of service and severity of illness. Um, so how sick is this person and how much, how intense is the service that you're providing in this setting? So for instance, with an inpatient, if, if their severity of their illness and the intensity of their service is not enough to justify them being in a hospital, they need to be at a lower setting, a different setting maybe an outpatient setting, maybe a skilled nurse facility setting. And that's where they're really trying to have these reviews to say, we approve two more days for this patient based on what we know. Or we don't approve any additional days, you need to discharge this patient. Those types of things. They do peer clinical reviews where they get um, physicians to take a look at the documentation and render a clinical opinion. If the if you have a provider who's saying, no, this patient absolutely needs to stay in the hospital for another two days, and the organ the utiliz utilization review has re has taken this to the managed care insurance company, and insurance is saying no, then you can have a, a arranged phone call usually with the physician caring for the patient and a managed care organization physician, and they talk about it, and they share the medical record, and then you've got a 
um, a peer physician situation going on where they're saying, okay, here's what we, we think. But usually before you get to a physician level um, peer review, you have nurse to nurse activity going on. So the first level is at the um, healthcare organization, you have someone within the healthcare organization who is usually a nurse who is doing the review and contacting the, or and putting the information into the insurance company's website and then getting the approval for the days. If that doesn't work, they usually have a phone call where you've got the um, utilization review nurse of the organization talking to a utilization review nurse from the managed care company and they're having a discussion. If there's still no agreement, that's when the two physicians get involved and then there is an appeals consideration. And that's when sometimes they'll pull in an expert clinician in the same specialty. And you can too, and they get these who are not involved in the initial decision. Um, they want that objectivity from both sides. So a lot of, I would say every utilization review program has a supervising physician who handles these appeals. Service management tools, again, um, so you've got your primary care physician who is your gatekeeper talking and it makes that determination as to whether or not referrals are warranted. And if so, where? and what's the appropriate level of care. You have prior approval, pre-authorization, pre-certification, and we talked about that, was it back in week eight, I think, with commercial health insurance? So if you're not sure about pre-authorization, pre-certification, um, pop back to chapter three and take a look, because I think we talked about it there. Then healthcare policy, um, whether these services require prior, prior approval, that's usually in policy form by the managed care company and they have those out on their websites and you can usually go take a look at that. There are also those second and third opinions. The goal is to prevent unnecessary test treatments, medical devices, or surgical procedures and they usually are obtained from experts within the healthcare plan. So that's where you have the organization, the healthcare organization that's trying to provide the test treatments, devices, procedures, or um, just basic nursing care, and then you have them and, and working with the managed care organization experts to try and see if they can come up with a compromise or bridge a gap or um, agree that yes, the patient needs to be discharged or patient does need this treatment or what have you. So that's where that all happens. Um, case management, looking at individual Case management is really looking at the individual outliers. What are the most complex or high cost cases? Um, how can we provide their care um, in a better way? Um, sometimes you have um, case managers who are looking at individual patients that are frequent frequent um, healthcare users to see. Can we set up a situation with home health care? Can we set up a situation where, some, where a nurse or a physician or a PA or nurse practitioner calls them once or twice a week and has a phone consultation and that keeps them from um, ending up needing to go to a physician office or go to um, the ED or those types of things? Um, they often work on workers' comp cases, severe head injury cases, making sure that the follow-up and the rehab that happens there happens appropriately. Then, of course, you have prescription management. Almost everybody these days has a formulary. The formulary lists what is covered and how much it costs um, and what's not covered. Um, pharmacy benefit managers have become um, a trend where they look at the the plan prescription drug benefits and work with um, patients and providers to say this is covered, this is not covered, here's an alternative. Perspective payment. We've talked a lot about that I think in other courses um, and so um, I don't want to get into the definition of perspective payment. If you're not sure what that is or perspective reimbursement, um, go out and, and take a look at that online. But there's really two main methodologies when it comes to managed care. Now this is again, managed care. There's capitation, that's that per member per month, PMPM, PM, 
um, or there's a global payment where you get one fixed amount and that has to be divided amongst everybody that took, care, took part in the patient's care, whether that's the healthcare organization, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, the ED physician, all of that. It, they, they get one global payment that usually goes to the healthcare organization and then the healthcare organization has to determine how to pay it all out. But that's all they pay. So if the cost is more than the payment, then everybody loses money that provided the services. And then if you're not sure again what capitation is, I would really encourage you to go out and take a look at that as well. Financial incentives, um, there are some to providers. They involve referrals. Um, are the referrals appropriate and that sort of thing and not too excessive? Number of inpatient days, the productivity is number of visits per day. Um, if there's positive results, they may get bonuses for meeting targets. A lot of times HEDIS measures are used by managed care organizations as well for incentives. Um, negative is they get a reduction of their salary when the target's not met. And then members, um, they have cost sharing and they get higher um, coinsurance or copayment costs when they use out-of-network providers. And um, if they go to the ED rather than urgent care, um, you know, there's so many things that can be dealt with at an urgent care versus the ED. And so um, there's oftentimes a financial incentive, disincentive, I should say, disincentive for someone to go to the ED versus urgent care because the co-payment is higher for that ED visit. So a couple of different types of managed care organizations, HMOs and PPOs. HMOs, there is a variety of freedom. They have closed and open panels. There are four models, staff, group practice, network, independent, independent practice. PPOs tend to be virtual and decentralized. They influence members to use in-network by higher cost sharing provisions for out-of-network, and they have a discounted fee schedule instead of capitation. Now, I really want you to memorize this slide as well, the information on here. Make sure you understand the differences between HMOs and PPOs because you will need this for your quiz, all right? And you might very well need it for your RHIT exam. So um, just keep this in mind. All right, um, point of service versus provider sponsored organization. Point of service members choose how they receive services at the time they need them. It's open ended HMOs. Um, physician PSOs are physicians who practice in a regional or community hospital that, that organizes the plan. So that's the difference between um, PSOs and POSs. And again, it is helpful to know this. Make sure that you know this. If you're not sure, check back with your book. All right, types of um, managed care organizations. This is also another one, exclusive provider organization. And so again, so I would say these, these slides from 14 through 16, make sure that you know those, 14 through 16, make sure you study those well. Please, 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 hint, hint, hint. All right, so managed care and government sponsored programs, we talked about Medicaid. CHIP and Medicare Advantage, and this gives you the percentages. And obviously they don't have one for CHIP, which would be interesting to research. So um, if you are interested in that, please do. I'd be interested to know what that percentage is of, of managed care penetration. All right, integrated delivery systems. What in the world are those? They collect, they're a collaborative integration of healthcare providers. It can be a very large health system, shall we say, um, I worked for one of these. In North Carolina, I worked for an integrated delivery system. They owned over 36 hospitals across three states, and those hospitals were part of health systems that had skilled nursing facilities, had um, even the one I worked for had a retirement community um, where you could um, buy into a cottage, and that covered you as you moved into independent living apartments or when you ended up going for skilled nursing care, or they even had a memory um, wing for those who had dementia. So that is all part of that. It's, it's physician practices, it's outpatient clinics, it is everything in that continuum of care. Hospice, home health care, durable medical equipment, we're all part of that um, 
that the health systems that were all in in that integrated delivery system that was one big huge health system organization so that would be an example of an integrated delivery system they have everything and they go from start to finish birth to death and everything in between and they can arrange to coordinate that and they do that on a contract basis so for instance a lot of our managed care contracts were across the whole system of all those hospitals they had um, they were part of that overall umbrella contract and that's the way a lot of them are doing it these days you think of um, of the um, two major health systems in Iowa, the two major players, Unity Point and Mercy One, and they are trying to do the same things, have one contract that covers all of their facilities across the entire state and even into other states. All right, financial agreements or contracts form the legal entity. Yes. Types of integration, they can have process integration. Um, coordination of direct patient care activities example the place I worked at in North Carolina even though we had our own hospitalists and intensivists our in our ICU was linked up to the major the nearest major medical center trauma level care ICU and their physicians their intensivists and experts we're not only watching our ICU patients, but others that had linked up with that. So that's an example of process integration for direct patient care activities. We also had telehealth services from them for telepsychiatry in the ED around the clock. Even though we had an inpatient behavioral health unit, our psychiatrists were not around the clock contracts. So we had telehealth, telepsychiatry through the ED to provide that. So it was direct patient care activity. It was coordinated. There is also functional integration, so make sure you know the differences. Process integration is clinical. Functional integration are those things that support that direct patient care, like information systems and financial management and human resources. Again, our IT system was all part of that. We had the same IT system as all those other 36 healthcare hospitals systems did that were all part of that. Um, it, we didn't have individual facility twists. We very much stayed the course when it came to financial management, information systems, and human resources. So there was the functional integration as well. So integrated delivery systems. You can have a group without walls. You can have PHOs. You can have MSOs, a medical foundation, and then an IPO. And if you are not sure what all these mean, I would direct you back to your textbook for that. Consolidation, this is where you have acquisitions and mergers that are happening. This can happen not only with um, managed care organizations, but it can also happen with, uh, and often does, with hospitals and healthcare systems. Horizontal is when you have hospital to hospital mergers. Vertical consolidations are when um, you have a hospital that takes on, say, a nursing home or you have physician practices that are purchased by hospitals, and that's a vertical one that is um, sort of aligning the continuum of care vertically. Horizontal is your merging identical things. Maybe you have a large group practice in your in in a nearby city, and they decide they're going to merge with another one that is twenty miles away, and so now you have two large physician group practices, and that's horizontal consolidation. All right, consolidation. Why do you even consolidate? Well, there are definite um, definite cost reductions when you do economies of scale. Um, and negotiating leverage is incredible. Um, think about this. If you're purchasing a product, and let's just say because of COVID, you want to get the N95 masks, and let's say a company is selling those. Do you think that they will give a cost reduction to a health system that has 36 hospitals versus an individual hospital? Um, you can see where it gains negotiating leverage, and especially when you're talking about um, managed care organizations. Um, do they, does a managed care organization want to negotiate with a single hospital in a single location, or are they more interested in getting, um, in driving costs down and negotiating um, with a large 
healthcare system that covers three states and covers hundreds, you know, millions of, of patients instead of just um, maybe 10,000 patients. Consolidation increases diversity of business lines and, in, and it often, often improves quality and reduces costs through standardization of care. If it's done correctly, consolidation can really be a, an incredibly positive thing. Done badly, um, which I experienced at one point in my career, and I won't say, say what state I was in, but I was part of a very large hospital that merged with one across the city. And I have to say, I had my doubts from the beginning that that was a wise decision. And about three years after I left the organization, the merger had, the consolidation had gone so badly wrong that they pulled it apart and they ended up reselling the hospital that I worked at um, to a for-profit organization. And the other hospital, I think, was part of, made part of a different organization. But the merger had to be undone because the consolidation was not handled appropriately and they did not improve quality or reduce costs and gain the, the economies of scale or negotiating leverage that they had hoped for. So when done well, you do see these things and I have seen them throughout my career. I've experienced it in Indiana and North Carolina for sure. Um, but when it's not done well, it's not good. All right, well, that is the end of the slideshow. That's it for Chapter 5, Managed Care. I'd really encourage you to take a look at your textbook. Make sure you read through it thoroughly. And um, this week, you, we've got a discussion, an assignment, a case study, a quiz, and then, of course, this lecture video. Hope you're doing well. Take care, and I will be back next week to talk to you about Chapter 6 and 8. All right, have a great week.